one of the main things that happens within ecosystems is the uh, transfer of matter and energy between members of the populations. And so when we look at communities, we look at the feeding relationships within the communities, and there are several different levels within the, within the communities. We call the food transfer sequence up the trophic levels a food chain. And this is, what this is doing is it's moving the chemical nutrients and energy from the producers the, the photosynthetic organisms up through the levels, uh, the feeding levels within the community. Producers, producers are the autotrophs that support all the other levels. Uh, that can be plants, it could be algae, it could be chemosynthetic bacteria or photosynthetic bacteria. Um, whatever it is that produces energy without having to get it from another organism, using energy from some other source, whether from the sun or from uh, chemical compounds, um, that that's going to produce food. The consumers are the heterotrophs, and there are several levels within within that uh, category. Herbivores are called primary consumers. These eat uh, all or mostly plant material or algae or chemosynthetic bacteria. Um, the secondary consumers eat the prime, the herbivores, the primary consumers. The tertiary consumers eat secondary consumers, and quaternary consumers eat tertiary consumers. It usually doesn't go any higher than that, although it can occasionally go a little bit higher. But um, generally, the four four levels is about as far as you go. Um, also, keep in mind that each organism doesn't necessarily eat only one thing. Some eat other things, and so, um, for instance, when, when you eat a salad, uh, generally speaking, you're a herbivore or a primary consumer, but if you eat a salad that has hard-boiled eggs and cheese and meat in it, then you're going to be a secondary uh, as well as a primary consumer of, the, of what you're eating in that particular meal. Detritivores are organisms that consume detritus. This is the dead material that's that's left over, kind of the leftovers uh, that are produced at all of the different levels. Um, and then decomposers, another important part of the ecosystem, mainly prokaryotes and fungi, they're going to actually break molecules down, the organic molecules down into simpler forms, uh, even or inorganic forms that can be used by themselves in any other organism in the building of molecules. So here we have two food chains. This is on the left, we have a terrestrial food chain, and on the right, an aquatic food chain. And so we see here the producer level at the bottom. We've got the plant on the terrestrial. With, uh, the primary consumer in this particular case is a grasshopper that's eating the flower. Uh, secondary consumer would be the mouse eating the grasshopper. The tertiary would be the snake eating the mouse, and the quaternary would be the hawk eating the snake. If the hawk was eating the mouse, that would make the hawk at that particular level a tertiary consumer rather than a quaternary consumer. In the aquatic food chain, we have phytoplankton, which is the uh, photosynthetic algae um, in, the, in the water. Zooplankton, all the uh, animal-like uh, protista in the water that it might eat the algae would be the primary consumers, and then the herring or other small fish like that would be the secondary consumers. A larger fish like a tuna would be tertiary, and then the killer whale, uh, if the killer whale eats the tuna, that would be a quaternary consumer. Generally speaking, when we, uh, when we are eating, we generally eat at the, at the primary and secondary level, although occasionally we have tertiary, and then occasionally we have, uh, quaternary as well, most often when we eat fish because fish, usually aquatic food chains, are going to have more, more steps in them than most uh, terrestrial food chains do. Now, a food web is all the interconnecting food chains in a particular area. Remember, consumers can eat more than one type of food, more than one type of producer, or more than one level of troph uh, trophic level, and then several species of consumers can feed on the same species of producer or on the same species of other levels, other trophic levels within the food web. And so it becomes much more complex when you look at the entire feeding relationships within, within an ecosystem, like you see here. Depending on what uh, the animal is eating, then uh, it can be at, at one, two, or even three different levels, um, depending on what it's what it's consuming. If the hawk eats the snake that has eaten the mouse that ate the grasshopper that ate the plant, then that would make the hawk a quaternary consumer. But it, uh, but if the hawk ate the um, ate the mouse 
then it b might be a secondary consumer. And if it ate the, uh, the mouse that just ate plant material, it would be a secondary consumer. And so it can be very complicated depending on the feeding relationships within the ecosystem that you're looking at. Now, if you remember, we talked about the fact that we're moving both matter and energy through the ecosystem. And so we were looking at the, the food molecules that pass through, but that's also related to the energy flow. OK, so remember that um, in an ecosystem, energy flow moves through the components of the ecosystem because energy comes from outside the ecosystem, ultimately from the sun. And then the chemical cycling is transfer of materials within the ecosystem. So within your ecosystem, the feeding relationships between the different animals, uh, different organisms within the, um, within the ecosystem are going are gonna to cycle the tra or transfer the materials within the ecosystem. Um, primary production by definition, is the amount of solar energy that is converted to chemical energy by the producers in an ecosystem for the particular area you're talking about during a given time period. The amount of living organic material in an ecosystem is called the biomass. Different ecosystems are going to vary in primary production uh, and their co contrib contribution to the total production of the biosphere depending on various factors including the, what time of year it is, you know, what the weather is like, uh, what other conditions might influence the, um, the production. And the primary production can vary from, from year to year and from season to season, depending on what's going on at that particular time. A pyramid of production shows this energy flow from the producers to the primary consumers in higher levels. Okay, So here we have uh, of the original million kilocalories of sunlight that, that shines on the plants. The producers would store about 10,000 kilocalories of energy. If the primary consumer eats that plant that represents about 10,000 calories, okay, it's going to transfer about 1,000 calories of the 10,000 to, to its systems. Some of that will be used by the, by the organism to build molecules. Some will be lost as heat. When the secondary consumer eats that primary consumer, it'll get only 100 calories of that original amount of energy uh, passed on to it. And the same with the tertiary, only gets 10 calories out of that 100. So only about 10% of the energy at each trophic level uh, is going to be available to the next level. That's an estimate, and it's you know, but it's considered a general rule. It's called the rule of 10%. When we eat, of course, grain or fruit, we're going to be primary consumers. When we eat beef or things like that from herbivores, we're going to be secondary consumers. When we eat trout or salmon or other kinds of fish, we're tertiary or quaternary consumers. But remember, we only get about 10% of the chemical energy, and so it's better off, we're better off if we eat, we get 10, more time, 10 times more energy available when we eat plants instead of the meat of herbivores. And so um, that generally, that's what they base the food pyramid on, basically, is that you should get most of your energy from plant materials and less and less of your energy at the higher trophic levels. Now when we talk about the matter, we have to talk about how we get that matter into, into the ecosystem. We've got a uh, continual influx of energy from the sun as, and also heat from the Earth's interior, okay? But we don't really have any uh, extraterrestrial sources of chemical elements. So our life depends on recycling the chemicals that are already here. We're going to talk about these uh, cycles of various kinds of nutrients called biogeochemical cycles. There are biotic or living components. There are abiotic or non-living components. There are also reservoirs where the chemical is stockpiled or saved outside the living organisms. And we can talk about biogeochemical cycles as being very localized or being global in, in range, just depending on what part of the ecosystem we're looking at. So the general uh, pattern of uh, recycling basically uh, the abiotic reservoir kind of is where the storage part is okay that makes uh, minerals or nutrients available to producers producers use those nutrients incorporate them in their tissues which are then uh, consumed by the consumers uh, and used for their needs 
when the consumers and producers die, the decomposers break those more complex molecules down to simpler ones, and that helps restore uh, some of the reservoir of uh, the, a the abiotic component of whatever that particular nutrient happens to be. And of course, some of these are even cycled through geologic processes like um, rock formation and um, uh, the water cycle and various things like that. The first one we'll talk about is the carbon cycle. The carbon is, of course, the main ingredient in all organic molecules. And so we find it lots of different places, like in the air and in uh, oil, fossil fuels like coal and oil, um, and also dissolved in the ocean. Returning carbon dioxide to the atmosphere by respiration is going to balance pretty much its removal by photosynthesis. Um, we breathe uh, out carbon dioxide as a result of our cellular respiration and that restores carbon dioxide to the atmosphere which can be used by the producers by photosynthetic organisms to make sugars which then can be, then be used for fuel for themselves and for us as well. The carbon cycle is also affected by the burning of wood and of fossil fuels because they also are made of carbon compounds which will when burned produce carbon dioxide. Here we see a diagram illustrating the carbon dioxide cycle, or the, the carbon cycle, carbon and oxygen cycle, it's often called. Okay, and so we have um, carbon carbon dioxide in the air, okay, used by used by plants in photosynthesis, uh, consumed by the primary consumers, um, given off, of uh, course, as a result of cellular respiration. Primary consumers eat the higher, the, are eaten by the higher level consumers. Both of them produce waste that produces detritus that can be decomposed by soil microbes to, to release some CO2 back into the air. Uh, the trees and other plants also undergo cellular respiration and release them back into the air. And so this works pretty well. And then we have the addition of burning of wood and fossil fuels, which adds more CO2 to the atmosphere. So when you hear things about um, greenhouse gases being added to the atmosphere, that's what it's talking about, the fact that we're adding more CO2 to the atmosphere, making the atmosphere trap more heat on Earth, which contributes to the warming of the Earth. Uh, all organisms require phosphorus for all different kinds of things, mostly for nucleic acids and also for phospholipids and ATP, which are very vital components of cells. The only source of phosphorus in terrestrial ecosystems is in rocks, basically. And so we have to get it from the plants. Plants absorb phosphate ions from the soil, and then they're used in their organic compounds and then returned, by, of course, by the decomposers. In aquatic systems, the, the phosphorus levels are typically pretty low, and they're generally a limiting factor in, uh, in the growth of um, of aquatic plants and so forth. And so when you have an addition of phosphorus into an aquatic ecosystem, oftentimes you see unbridled growth in the, um, in the producers, which can be problematic unless you have enough consumers to eat it. Um, here we have uh, the phosphorus cycle showing that you've got phosphorus, of course, in the phosphates in the rock, which can be uh, assimilated by plants into their tissues, eaten by animals. Uh, they all produce detritus, which is decomposed in the soil. Um, the phosphates in the soil kind of get into the sol into solution in the water and can be precipitated out into solids, which over time can become rock. And the weathering of the rock is what produced the phosphates in the first place to, uh, to be assimilated by the plants. So a nice little cycle there, but definitely depends on an abiotic reservoir in the rock. The third major cycle is the nitrogen cycle. And the nitrogen is, remember, very, very important to lots of things. Of course, it's re required in nucleic acids. It's required in proteins. It's definitely something that is necessary to all organisms. And it is also a, a, oftentimes a limiting nutrient for plants. There are two abiotic reservoirs of nitrogen, the atmosphere, which about 75 to 80 percent is nitrogen gas and also in the soil. Now here's the problem with nitrogen. We have lots of nitrogen available but most living things can't use elemental nitrogen, nitrogen gas. We have to depend on bacteria that live in the soil for the process of nitrogen fixation. This process uh, converts nitrogen gas into compounds that can be used by plants. And so it depends, we depend definitely on bacteria in the soil to take care of 
putting new nitrogen into um, a form that can be used by other living things, otherwise we would not be able to get enough of it. So here's the nitrogen cycle, okay? We have nitrogen-fixing bacteria in the root nodules of some plants and just free living in the soil of, uh, in other areas that take nitrogen gas from the atmosphere and change it into uh, compounds like ammonium and nitrates. Ammonium is one compound that is present, that is made by nitrogen-fixing bacteria. There are some bacteria that take those, nitri those the ammonias and change them into nitrates that can be assimilated by plants, and the plants can also assimilate ammonium as well. Uh, Denitrifying bacteria take some of those nitrates and release some of the nitrogen back to the atmosphere. The plants, of course, incorporate the nitrogen into their tissues, which are eaten by animals. When both plants and animals die, they produce detritus, which, by, which is broken down by decomposers to release some of these um, nitrogen compounds like ammonia back into the soil. So it's an ongoing cycle um, that usually provides enough nutrients for everybody. Now, like we saw for phosphates, uh, phosphorus, nitrogen is also a limiting factor uh, oftentimes in aquatic ecosystems. And so low nutrient levels for both phosphorus and nitrogen can lead to a, a, a decrease in the primary production or limit in primary production. So when a, when a uh, running water system uh, that, you know, has a constant overturning of the water. But in standing water, oftentimes, uh, like a pond that doesn't have an outlet, uh, they're going to accumulate nutrients from decomposing organic material. And that can lead to eutrophication, which is when you have excessive plant growth due to receiving excess nutrients. And it might look something like this that you have a, uh, an area where you have just a green scum on the ponds because you've got lots of, of uh, organic, lots of nitrates and phosphorus in the, in the water from runoff, and that leads to an overgrowth of algae, which can be harmful overall to the pond. Um, the algae can, uh, can, when they start dying, when the nutrients run out, uh, can remove a lot of the oxygen from the water, which can kill a lot of the fish, like we talked about with um, with algae um, blooms that you sometimes can see.